Second Chronicles chapter 7. Tonight we're going to have communion, so I just would encourage you to be sensitive and open to the Holy Spirit. We're going to have a time where you can share what the Lord is doing and putting on your heart. And so as we're going through the study, He might minister something in particular that He would have you minister to the body here. So just be open to that and... Um, We'll see what the Lord's going to do tonight. As we get into the study tonight, I want to remind you that the Lord's so good. He's giving a second chance to the nation of Israel here. And He's reminding them pretty much how it works. He's reminding them of the way to interact with God the way to understand God, the way to carry out their life with God. You may recall in the beginning we talked about the newness that God was bringing to the nation of Israel. And that's what He does to us. He does that every day for us. He makes every day new. Every experience in Him is new. It's a beautiful thing how God refreshes us, restores us. Especially when we're born again. The Bible says if any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. He makes us new. He makes us new to what? To be worshipers. We spent quite a bit of time looking at how God wants to build into the believer's life worship. And really, we're, we're called to be worshipers. That's, that's really what it means when we come into a relationship with God. We come to a, come to a place where we just worship God. We're just caught up in His presence. And as we looked at that, we saw then how Solomon dedicated the temple. And how he dedicated the temple, it was dedicating the people, in a sense, to keep God the center and have their lives be lives of worship. That God wouldn't be just an aspect or a segment of their life, but God would be everything. And so as Solomon dedicates the temple, we see the Lord speaking to Solomon. That's uh, once again in chapter 7. It begins with the Lord giving him then these instructions. The Lord specifically is speaking to Solomon. We sort of left off with verse 14. If you want to take a look there, we'll we'll begin there. We we covered that. We're going to take a running start at it. And he speaks to this, this group of people that was picked out to be a people that would draw others into the knowledge of God. That was their calling. And so God blessed them. He blessed them so others would know who God is. And their blessings were seen in the development of their nation. As their nation developed, as Solomon is the king, they dedicate the temple. We see then in verse 14 that gives us an idea that that there's going to be some some issues. He says, "If, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and will pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. This is the antidote for a land that's gotten sick. It's an antidote for a sick nation. It really starts with God's people. We looked at that. We saw the importance and the responsibility that, that believers have for our nation. And the importance of concentrating and focusing our efforts first and foremost on our own lives and living in lives that would draw attention to the Lord. That our lives would bear witness of a, a gracious God, a good God, a loving God. And that would be done through our lives, through our lifestyle. In the New Testament, we see the Holy Spirit coming on the church, upon the church, and it was so that they would be witnesses to those around them. And so we see that purpose anchored. And see, when God's people 
forget that purpose or get off track from God's purpose or misunderstand or just neglect God's purpose. It's necessary for God to intervene. And so he says, here's the answer. Here's the answer for a nation. This applies to us, doesn't it? We have a sick, a sick nation. A nation that needs the Lord. A nation that needs the hope of Jesus Christ. It needs us to be those people who offer that, to be lights and to be salt. And so he says, my people, come to me first. Be humble. Get on your knees before me. Pray for your nation. Pray for yourselves. Because when those who represent God fail, nations suffer. So he says then in verse 15, he says, Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to prayer made in this place. Speaking about the temple. He says, For now I have chosen and have sanctified this house that my name may be there forever and my eyes and my heart will be there perpetually. Now that description of, his, of God's heart, that's not very common in the Bible. In fact, the other few places that we see God referring to His heart are referring more to the sin of a nation and his concern for their wickedness. Here he's talking about, I'll, I'll have a, a heart for those who pray and that put me in the center of their lives. And I'll hear what they're saying. We, we know that from the New Testament that God also says if we ask anything in his name that he'll, he'll hear our prayers. We can ask anything in his name and he'll do it the same idea. It's the, the, the confidence that he's restoring in the children of Israel who are, have blown it and now they're coming back into the land. Reestablishing the principles and the foundation for all of their blessings that they started with. God continues with this discussion to Solomon. He says, as for you, speaking individually to Solomon, he says, if you walk before me as your father David walked and do according to all that I have commanded you and if you keep my statutes and my judgments, then I will establish the throne of your kingdom as I have covenanted with David your father, saying, you shall not fail to have a man as ruler over Israel. So he's now speaking about the importance of Solomon's influence over the nation. And he had a big responsibility. He had a, a responsibility to influence the nation for godliness. He, he connects that with David. I find that interesting. Because he's talking about the blessings and he's talking about the success of their nation and he, he's saying, if you walk like David walked. Now that's interesting because we know he didn't walk perfectly. We know he had some very, very grievous sins. But he, yet he's saying, if you walk like David walked. That's interesting because what we find here as we continue on, we're going to find that as Solomon was, was pretty good about keeping a lot of the external rules and regulations, ordinances, or the order of things, following the form of the law. He's pretty good about that. But what we find here is he's being instructed that the way David walked was that his heart was a heart that was in love with God. And that's so important to get this. Because as we're going to see with Solomon, it didn't end up well with Solomon. And he, he did a, a lot of things according to the right form and the right instructions. But yet, we find he just he didn't have a heart that loved the Lord. And it's easy to get little things in our hearts, little 
idols, little, little sins, little calluses, hardness. And those are the things that are being spoken of here, of how important it is that we address those things. We have the answer for that in verse 14. It's repentance. And it's keeping that relationship with the Lord that's just pure. It's honest. It's not hiding things, which is kind of ridiculous. We can't really hide things from the Lord. But we like to segment things off. There's a, a tendency of, of us that we, we have a part for God. And God keeps moving us towards giving our whole self to Him. And so he says, I want you to be like David, your father. I want you to be one who walks with me relationally, who knows me, who understands me, who talks to me, and I talk to you. That's how I want you to be. I'm not looking for perfection. I'm not looking for obedience to rules because that will naturally follow from our relationship. And David was certainly blessed, wasn't he? David was blessed. And so he's, he says, again in verse 17, he says, if you walk before me as David walked. And then he says, and, and then you do according to all that I have commanded you, keeping the statutes and the judgments. So it's interesting because the walk of David will result in the fruit of blessing. It will result in naturally following after the Lord. And when, when we blow it, when we mess up, we ask God to forgive us. We don't go off now and just continue on that road. We, we stay before the Lord. And we say we're sorry. We repent. You see how dramatic that is because really the whole nation was dependent on that situation. Isn't it amazing how destructive sin is? He's talking to Solomon and, and we know that it didn't work out too good, but it's the same with us. Sin is absolutely devastating. And sin is compared to leaven in the Bible. It, it spreads. No matter what sin it is, we can never think that it's just going to stay right with us. It never does. It never will. It never can. Sin doesn't work like that. Sin destroys. Sin eats. Sin damages. Sin spreads. So God's, God's saying, Solomon, here's, I'm going to lay it out for you. Here's how it works. And if you just walk with me, then you're going to experience my blessing and the plan at work where I work in and through you to bring those nations to a relationship with me as well. And then in verse 18 he says, Then I will establish that throne. So the throne will con continue. There will be a ruler over Israel. They will have their place is what he's saying. And then in verse 19, he says, But if you turn away and forsake my statutes and my commandments which I have set before you, then you will go and serve other gods and worship them. Now, it's interesting as we read that, when we leave the Lord, we're not going to any random place. We're going towards the enemy. It's kind of a two-way street there. We're either going towards the Lord or we're going towards the enemy. And so he says, to walk as David walked, follow after me, but if you turn, where, where will you be turning? You'll be worshiping false gods. That's the only place we turn. There's no other place. When we turn away from God, we worship false gods. And there will be a consequence. He says, then I will uproot them from my land 
which I have given them, and this house which I have sanctified for my name, and I will cast out of my sight, and I will make it a proverb and a byword among all the people. That's exactly what happened to Israel, isn't it? It's exactly, this is a, a testimony. Isn't it interesting? You ever think about why the world hates Jewish people? That's just such a weird thing, isn't it? Why not Irish people or Scottish people or English people or, you know? There's just a, a worldwide hatred towards Israel. And here, this is the reason why. God said, God said that would happen. If they turned, if they forsook him, that that's exactly what would happen. And so this is sort of prophecy a fulfillment of what had happened. He says, And as for this house, the temple, which is exalted, everyone who passes by it will be astonished and say, Why has the Lord done thus to this land and to this house? And they will answer, Because they forsook the Lord God of their fathers who brought them out of the land of Egypt. And then what did they do? They embraced other gods. Do you see that? It's such a, a trick of Satan to think we just can go off, kind of do our own thing a little bit. It's such a, a wrong concept. The right concept is when we disobey God, we're obeying the devil. We're falling into his hands. That's why God, He sees that, He knows that. That's why He says, keep walking with me. Because when you turn away from me, you're turning into enemy territory and the enemy's desire is to destroy you. And so the nation of Israel, they, they have that put out. They have that before them. They're told that. And notice the, the reason is so that People would know one way or the other that, that God is real. The God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. If, if they disobeyed God and went away from Him, they would know that He's real by what would happen from straying from them. They would also know that God is real, better yet, if they honored, worshipped Him, and put Him at the center of everything. But one way or the other, God will be honored and there will be a testimony to God. See, if there is no justice or no, if, if, if Israel just went off and did their own thing and it, it would give people a false wrong idea about who God is. That's, that's why this is so serious. And so it's necessary for God to work to bring people back to a place where they worship Him correctly again. And that's what happened with the nation of Israel. But for us, we see that application. God will let us go off. But He'll, if we're a true believer, He'll bring us back. And we have that option sort of to come back ourselves or to come back the hard way, which... None of us really want to do that. But God will bring us back. That's a good thing if you're a believer. God will bring the believer back. But oftentimes if we don't repent, if we don't pay attention or take heed to God's warnings and God's encouragement and God's red flags, we don't do that, then He'll bring us back the hard way. Now, the nation of Israel has that now out there. God's speaking directly to Solomon in this regard. So Solomon knows. So in chapter 8, verse 1, so it says now, it came to pass at the end of 20 years when Solomon had built the house of the Lord and his own house, which interestingly, the house of the Lord took about 7 years and his own house took about 13 years. A lot more energy and effort. It just gives you a little clue about Solomon. Remember, it's a heart thing, right? 
So he's finished. He says in verse 2 that the, the cities which Hiram, if you pronounce it correctly, it's Hiram. I'm not going to do that, though. The cities which Hiram had given to Solomon, Solomon built them, and he settled the children of Israel there. You may remember that. Hiram was from Tyre. He was kind of a, a buddy of Solomon. And Solomon needed some, some more gold, a lot more gold to build the temple. So he told Hiram that he would give him wheat and barley and oats and all that sort of thing for gold. And they sort of went over budget. So he wasn't able to give him all the stuff he needed, Hiram. So he gave him these cities that are being talked about here. But those cities, once Hiram looked at them, they were so bad, he didn't want them. So he gave them back. So that's from Second Chronicles chapter 2. And then you can look at um, 1 Kings chapter 9 as well. No, yeah, chapter 9. So he starts to build those cities, sort of a urban renewal project. And Solomon in verse 3, he went to Hamath, Zobah, and he sees that. He also built Tadmor in the wilderness and all the stored cities which he built in Hamath. He built Upper Beth Haran and Lower Beth Haran fortified cities with walls, gates, and bars, and Bahalath, and all the stored cities that Solomon had, and all the chariot cities, and all the cities of Calvary, and all that Solomon desired to build in Jerusalem, in Lebanon, and in all the land of his dominion. So basically, now that Solomon's finished with the temple, now he goes about and he starts to settle the land and develop the land all around him. And so this, this is what happens for this good picture of the believer that when God heals us, restores us, he, he makes us holy in Christ, makes us whole, then we're fit to go build his kingdom. We're fit to be builders. And that effectiveness of the believer's life, it really comes from our life in Christ that has been made new and made whole in Him. And now we have the Holy Spirit and to build the kingdom of God, it has to be a reproduction of the Holy Spirit in our life. So building comes from a believer's abiding or, if you will, closeness, intimacy, connection with God Himself, the natural byproduct of that is building spiritual things. And that's what, that's what the believer is called to do. But we can't do that if we're not whole. So it, it takes a whole person and the wholeness comes from the Holy Spirit making us whole. And that effectiveness then that comes from a, a believer who is complete in Christ, who's received the forgiveness of Jesus and is walking as a whole new man. It reminds me of the, the beggar at the gate, the beautiful, begging for money. And who was it Peter and James said, silver and gold have we not, but what we do have we, get, we give you, arise and walk. It's the same with us. It's, it's a group of people that have been made whole in Jesus Christ and God says, go and walk in the Lord and watch the kingdom of God be built in and through you. But it all starts with that intimacy. It all starts with our personal relationship with God. And so he continues on with this building project and in verse 7 he says, all the people who are left of the Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, Jebusites, who are not of Israel, that is, their descendants who were left in the land after them, whom the children of Israel did not destroy. That's pointed out because they were supposed to destroy them. 
utterly destroy them. These people became a problem for them later. And Solomon, watch what he does with those, those people. He held on to them. Kind of gives us an idea maybe why they didn't completely conquer. He says in verse 8, that is, their descendants who were left in the land after them, whom the children of Israel did not destroy, from these Solomon raised up forced labor as it is to this day. We find Solomon seemed to put capitalism, industry, profit above his relationship with God. So there's one thing that seemed to get in the way of his worship of God. We find compromise in that area with Solomon. And then he says in verse 9, Solomon did not make the children of Israel servants for his work, some were men of war, captains of his officers, captains of his chariots and his cavalry. Others were chiefs of the officials of the king of Solomon, 250 who ruled over the people. So the Israelites were more like the white collar people and all the other ites were more blue collar people, forced labor if you will. And then in verse 11, Solomon brought the daughter of Pharaoh up from the city of David to the house he had built for her. For he said, My wife shall not dwell in the house of David, king of Israel, because the, pal the places to which the ark of the Lord has come are holy. So you see what's going on with, with our good friend Solomon? He takes a wife from Egypt, from Pharaoh, which we know that they're specifically instructed, the kings are specifically instructed not to do that. But he knew because he had to have a separate house for her. He had to put her in a place, a separate place, because he knew she couldn't be in the place where the ark had been. He knew it was wrong. So it wasn't just some sort of oversight or mistake. We find this, this transgression after transgression, and we find his heart is sort of bent on getting his way. It's get, based on getting his product. And it seems like he didn't have a willingness to come before the Lord and just stop what he was doing because it keeps perpetuating. So Solomon here, as he sort of puts his wife over to the side, there's, there's a political issue with this as well, as he had get wives from the Egyptians. There's a political ploy here where if his wife was the Egyptian, it would give him a better relationship with the Pharaoh of Egypt. And it would also give Pharaoh uh, more resistance in attacking the nation of Israel. So he was definitely setting himself up. He was definitely putting himself in a, in a favorable worldly position. But what he didn't know is he wasn't in a good position with the Lord. Don't ever make that mistake to think that we can be in a good position in the world and think that makes us okay with the Lord. Oftentimes it's just the opposite. And so he puts his wife sort of to the side. It, it also speaks of how we can have a, a relationship with God that, that is, has a switch that we turn off and turn on. We turn it on in church, we turn it off when we go to work or wherever we go. God wants them to be worshipers everywhere they go. God would be the center of their being in everything they did. He would be their identity. So in verse 12, Solomon offered burnt offerings to the Lord on the altar of the Lord, which he had built before the vestibule, according to the daily rate, offering according to the commandment of Moses for the Sabbaths, for the new moons, and the three appointed yearly feasts, which were the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Feast of Weeks, and the Feast of Tabernacles. He was sure following the book, wasn't he? 
Can you see this problem that's being presented, though? It, again, it's, it's his heart. And I don't know, but it seems like it would make sense that because he did these, followed these rules so well, it probably gave him a false sense of security. It probably made some sort of appearance to him or convinced him in some way that, that he was okay in what he was doing. Because we know he knew what he was doing was wrong. But notice in verse 14, he says, And according to the order of David his father, he appointed the divisions of the priests for their service, the Levites for their duties, to praise and serve before the priests, as the duty of each day required, and the gatekeepers by their divisions at the gate. For so David, the man of God, had commanded. You see, he's just following all the rules. He's reading the book, and he was doing that. But yet his heart. Verse 15, They did not depart from the command of the king to the priests and the Levites concerning any matter or concerning the treasuries. Now all the work of Solomon was what? Well ordered. He was sharp. He was administratively on top of it. His desk was probably really organized. He probably had a really good to-do list. He was just doing everything right. But again, all those things are good. But because we know how to do church things, don't ever let that be the end all for us. The end all is Jesus Christ himself. So in verse 17, Solomon went to Eslon, Gerber, and Elath on the sea coast in the land of Eden. And Hiram sent him ships by the hand of his servants and servants who knew the sea. His Jewish people were terrible on the sea. They went with the servants of Solomon to Ophir and acquired 450 talents of gold from there and brought it to King Solomon. So next week we're, we're going to pretty much wrap up Solomon's life, his adventure in this book. But again, I can, I can take from this so much. And there's a reason that we're given all this, this information. And you keep it in context. You have to have to remember that God is showing the nation of Israel once again how to walk with Him, the significance of making God the center of our life.